The UK Psych Health and Safety and ISO 45003 podcast. So hello and welcome to the UK Psych Health and Safety podcast. My name is Sheila from BMR Health and Wellbeing. Uh, and my co-host today is Peter Kelly and our special guest all the way from uh, Perth, Western Australia is Jason Van Shee from Flourish DX. Now I know Pete and Jason are keen to get started and I know Pete's got lots of questions for Jason today. So I'm going to hand over to Pete and Jason um, and I'm going to let the guys do the most of the talking today. So over to you, Pete and Jason. Thank you very much. Well, Jason, <laughs> welcome to the UK uh, Psych Health and Safety podcast. Are you excited? Yes. Thanks for the invitation, Pete. I uh, I got to say, I love the name of the podcast. I have no idea how you came up with that original name, oh, mate. I don't know. Yeah, are you pumped? Are you ready? Are you ready for for me to ask you some questions? Always ready, mate. Always. All right. Well, let's start with an easy one, Jason. So this is a psych health and safety podcast, um, but we've also got this other thing called uh, psychosocial uh, risk and hazards. What's the difference between uh, psychological health and safety hazards and risk and psychosocial risk and hazards? I'd say it is the same name uh, or different names for the same thing, if you like. So um, psychological health and safety is really about applying a risk management process to the understanding of psychosocial hazards and the assessment of risk and controlling of that risk. Um, uh, yeah, so, and I guess psychosocial hazards maybe are an element of psychological health and safety, but I didn't realise, geez, Pete, that it was just going to be an assessment of my competence at the, at the top. Oh, no. Well, I do think it's important, isn't it? I mean, we both of us go into businesses and they say, well, what is it? What is a psychosocial hazard? I mean, let's get, take it back to its core basis. So what is a psychosocial hazard and what is a psychosocial risk, in your opinion? Yeah, so... For those, um, I guess, new to the area, and, and this is, I agree, Pete, even though I'm a bit facetious, that is my middle name, according to my wife. Um, you know, language very is wise really woman. Important. She's a very wise woman. <laughs> very, good, very good judge of character. Um, so a psychosocial hazard basically is anything in the design or management of work that contributes to work-related stress. Um, and that stress, if it's ongoing um, or is extreme, like in the case of exposure to occupational violence, uh, can lead to stress-related illnesses and psychological injuries. So psych hazard is anything that, if not managed properly, can contribute to stress. Um, and then the, the risk, uh, psychosocial risk, is the likelihood and consequence that harm will occur if someone is continued to be exposed to that hazard. So, so if, I had a, if I was in a job, let's say I went in the job and, and during, during the course of the day, I was, was clear of what I was expected to do. Um, but then I had these additional things put on me. Are they... Are they are they a hazard or do they, when did they, at which point did they become a risk? Is it one day, two days? What, what, what would you, what do you think? Well, that's the, uh, the, the question, isn't it, Pete? Like, you know, at what point does a, a, an amount of stress or a exposure to a element of work design become, become a risk? And if we think about like the, the vitamin model, for example, you know, um, there are differences for people. Some people, you know, thrive on autonomy. Other people like to just be told this is exactly what you need to do. Um, and so I guess it's, it's a tough one. And I guess in your role, Pete, you'd probably be more used to looking at uh, the impact on a collective or a group of people before you would actually consider um, something that the, you know, the regulator would be worthwhile investigating if people are, yeah, multiple people are getting sick. But I guess at a, at a workplace level, I think this is where line managers um, really are important to understand the different needs um, of their employees and really making sure that as far as possible, they're designing work for that particular uh, person or the person is given enough autonomy or freedom to craft, you know, their role. So it kind of fits their like right, right levels of, of stress or, ex or work design, if you like. Yeah. So but what, if, what if I've got 20 people working with me, but only one mm. of them's not not really doing it yeah that's right or you know is what feeling stressed because of yeah, the yeah. working but, conditions but, but everyone else is everyone else is so um yeah it's the question say? right and i'm sure as a regulator you get that question as well like you know if only one person's affected is it really an issue of work design or is it an individual issue um is is it two people is it five people is it 10 <laughs> i'd actually put the question back on you pete i mean i at that point myself personally i would be you know 
I would be thinking this is an individual issue and, you know, we need to talk to that individual about, you know, the role and, you know, if there's any, um, uh, you know, things that we can do within the role to accommodate their needs um, for a right level of autonomy or role clarity or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think the regulator would think it's a, a, a hazard myself, a psychosocial hazard, if it's only one out of 20 that's being affected. Well, it, I guess it depends if we found something in the system that was a, a source of a potential source of future stress. Um, so in, 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 a, in a sense, as you know, because I know you've read our website and the management standards, uh, we expect people to put in place a, a response to individual differences. So someone in your team isn't functioning uh, functioning well, or they, they, they report they're feeling work related stress, you still have a duty of care to do something about that. Um, and you cleverly, cleverly read our criteria for investigation, which is that we don't investigate individual cases, but we do look collectively at, we would look at a collection of cases. And, and that's principally because um, our our viewpoint, um, which we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll cover later on, is that you need to see work-related stress as an organisational issue. Um, but you also have a, a tertiary or a responsibility to the individual. But really, and I think we'll talk about what I'd like to cover later, is, is this second bit, is that secondary bit, is that how we train people and train line managers to, 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 do, what, uh, to do what they're doing and, and in... Uh, I don't know about you, Jason, but we, we know the term psychosocial risk and hazards. We know psychological health and safety. But outside of this, this sphere that, we, that we're in, how would you explain to someone what psychological health and safety is in a very practical way? Rather than saying it's, it's about the moderation of risk, et cetera, et cetera. How would you tell someone what we think psychological health and safety is? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I guess what I always come back to is to use things that they're familiar with. And obviously the understanding of physical hazards in the workplace is something that most health and safety uh, practitioners are obviously very familiar with. And then understanding risk management and hierarchies of controls. And, and no doubt we're going to talk about that later today as well. Um, but, you know, the examples we like to give are things like manual handling. You know, um, we know that, you know, people could go to the gym and get stronger and, um, you know, be able to lift heavier and, and not get injured. Um, but we also know that um, fundamentally, if we design work correctly in, 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 to begin with, um, where people aren't having to lift heavy loads and there's, you know, um, you know things that help, help them to, to do that safely, we're going to have less people getting injured regardless of whether they're going to the gym five days a week or not. Um, so I think if we can, you know, make that equivalent and go, well, there's physical hazard exposure, but then there's this psychological hazard exposure and psychological hazards are right, anything that causes people to be stressed ongoing or high levels. And often when I, I talk and use the physical health analogy, you know, you, you see people just switch on and go, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, I think in, in the past, what's really put off particularly health and safety practitioners from being involved with um, mental health or psychological health and safety is they feel like they have to be a psychologist or a counsellor or they um, think about psychological health and safety because it's got psychological in the name as like counselling or EAP or, you know, something like that. And they're like, well, no, that's not what I've signed up for. I'm involved in risk management. But as soon as you just start saying, well, look, it's, a, it's just a different hazard um, that can still make people ill and, you know, may lead to compensation claims or time off work, um, we just need to understand that hazard and monitor it and then work with um, subject matter experts like organisational development people or organisational psychologists to, you know, engineer or change the work environment to make sure that people don't get sick um, and, if possible, improve their wellbeing. Uh, then I think health and safety people actually get on board and go, okay, I understand that. I do have, um, you know, skills around risk management and I can apply them. It's just a different set of hazards. And then like dealing with an engineer to control physical hazards, I'm just dealing with a different professional to help engineer out the psychological hazards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look over here um, of the the days lost, only 20% is safety. So that would suggest, uh, you know, in terms of the issues that we have, uh, you know, are, are health-related. And on of those health-related, 57% uh, of that is work-related stress and mental health. Now, I know that the, the numbers are broadly equivalent um in australia in terms of the because you have a statewide system 
for managing it. Um, is there a time to act in this area, or do we just do we wait till we get even more? It's so interesting. Hey, I use those labour force um, survey statistics myself in in trying to explain the issue. Um, and what was it? Out of thirty point thirty eight point eight million days lost due to non fatal injuries and illnesses. 17.9 million days lost due to work-related stress, anxiety, depression. So that's actually 46% of all of the days lost, regardless of whether it was a physical injury or a, uh, an illness, um, were because of work-related stress, anxiety, and depression. And like you, you talk about, Pete, that was uh, one week. Um, in the reporting period was one week into the pandemic. So this mm-hmm. wasn't a COVID issue. Um, and obviously COVID's put the spotlight on um, mental health of, of employees. This was an issue, and we were at crisis point well before COVID hit. Um, and, and it wasn't enough to move the needle. People weren't actually doing anything different about it. Um, and, and I don't know what the driver is going to be. I have a lot of optimism um, over the next three to five years that employers are going to start doing a lot more in this space. And I really hope things like the incoming ISO 45003 standard is one of the drivers, or carrots at least, um, to yeah. you know, encourage companies to do the right thing and take more of a risk management approach. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know why people haven't um, done it. Maybe, maybe it is because of a lack of understanding or competence. And like yourself, that's why we're running our podcast, you know, to try and rapidly increase people's understanding of the space and uh, what practically they could be doing in their companies today. You know, I'm not waiting for regulators to be you know, inspecting them and saying, you guys aren't doing a good enough job. Um, you know, why should you wait till you're reprimanded to do anything when there are really good guidance materials out there, whether it's the management standards, whether it's, you know, the Safe Work Australia guidance or ISO. You think there are other drivers as well, like um, the insurance industry that can be oh, effective yeah. in this area? I think big time. I mean, we've already had insurers reach out to us. Um, they're the ones that are really hurting, right? I mean, in Australia, for example, um, New South Wales, the regulator there, um, uh, they've published some workers' compensation statistics. And uh, in the four years preceding 2019, so again, pre-pandemic, there was only a 3.5% increase in physical injury claims over that period, so pretty stable, Where, whereas there was a 53% increase in psychological injury claims. The problem being is that when a psychological injury claim is made, it usually results in about half a year off work on average uh, at a cost of about $85,000 Australian, which is about 10 pound, but you know, it's, it's big in Australian dollars. Um, and then, um, but it's like $20,000 on average for um, the physical injury claim. So they're costing yeah. more than four times the amounts because they're more complex, right? It's harder to get people back to work when they're off time, uh, off work for a period of time. So Insurers are the ones though that are that, that are wearing the cost, and you know we are exploring how we work with insurers, um, and then through their customers to actually take more of a systemic approach to the management of work-related stress as compared to the popular approach, which is very much focused on the individual and dealing with symptoms. Yeah, it's interesting you say the one in four because um, about eighteen years ago a figure came out from the treasury that the, the cost for mental health was one in four. Um, I remember sitting down with a group of investment bankers in the, in the city of London in a dark dungeon, because there literally was no windows. It's just a darkened room. Um, and, um, you know, asking them about, you know, what, how many people did they have off with work related stress? And one, one banker said, banking organization said they had three people off and they said, well, what's their salary? Now, obviously they're extremely well paid. Um, so I think there was something in the read they, their salary was around two and a half mil um, over the course of a year. So I said, so you got three people off. He said, well, what do you think you've lost? And when you extrapolate the four times the cost of them being off six months, they, they just looked, at you, looked and went, you know, so actually you're telling me you can't do a project that's going to cost you 100,000 when you're already losing um, eight and a half million. Yeah, just I mean, in, it's just, like, just in six months. Yeah, I mean, there's always an opportunity cost, right? If you have employees who are bringing in revenue for your company, then it's not just their salary that you're losing, but the um, opportunity cost as well um, of losing that potential revenue. So training, loss and loss and loss, loss and support and stuff like that. So, Jason, the elephant in the room question. So where I'm where already, do you I've already done those ones, Pete? Okay, give me no, up. no, they, these they were just like they weren't really elephants; they were giraffes, maybe. Uh, so where do you see 
uh, in the current research and the current uh, approaches to health and safety, psychological health and safety, the role of primary, secondary and tertiary and, and also hierarchy of control. And if you could explain to the audience, for those who are not familiar with those terms, what they are, then that'd be useful. And it saves me the opportunity of looking embarrassed for getting it wrong. <laughs> you wouldn't get it wrong. No, we've we've had this discussion back in Liverpool, I think, mate, when we first met. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so primary, secondary, tertiary is related to the public health model approach to uh, disease prevention, right? Um, primary prevention approaches are very much focused on 100% of the, um, the, the population and it's about how do we keep people well and assist them to have, uh, you know, in the case of mental health, high levels of well-being. Uh, secondary prevention is, you know, where people are at risk of becoming unwell. You know, what other supports can we provide to make sure they don't deteriorate or become ill and, you know, obviously become a cost burden on, on the system. Uh, and then tertiary intervention is when someone is ill, you know, what are we doing to support them? Um, very similar to that public health model is um, the integrated model of, of workplace mental health. And it's just different terminology, right? So we say mitigate illness, prevent harm and promote flourishing. Um, instead of that primary, secondary and, and tertiary. Now, I've always felt that the majority of interventions in the workplace very much are focused on the mitigate illness um, and the, the tertiary prevention. So um, how do we identify when someone's not doing well and provide them with support? And that might be through th formal things like employee assistance programs, counselling services. Uh, it might be through things like mental health first aid training. So training up certain people in the workplace to identify when people are not doing well and then direct them to professional support. The other area that is getting a bit more attention is the whole fruit bowls and yoga, um, which, uh, you know, is the primary prevention stuff. How do we keep people healthy? And whilst fruit bowls and yoga might be good for, you know, physical health and wellness, and there is some, you know, impact on, on mental wellness as well. Uh, I think we can do a lot more um, mental health type uh, activities to promote flourishing. So I really like the positive psychology model of PERMA um, in looking at some of the you know, key things you could do. So rather than focusing on nutrition, exercise and sleep um, or not just doing that exclusively, we could also look at things like, well, how do we increase positive relationships in the workplace? How do we give people a greater sense of meaning and purpose? How do we give them satisfaction with the accomplishments that they're making day to day? How do we get them to leverage their strengths and experience more flow? And how do we get them to experience more positive emotions like joy and love and gratitude in the workplace? So, um, you know, if we can target interventions at that primary prevention level like that, I think that would be something that would be suitable for 100% of the workforce. Um, and so even though, yeah, we are doing primary prevention, I think in, in um, health promotion, particularly in the physical sense in workplaces, I think there's definitely more we can do in the mental health and using that PERMA model is, is helpful. But the bit that's missing um, is the secondary prevention. So how do we identify when people are at risk? Um, and then put in controls to make sure they don't become ill. And this is actually where I think psychological health and safety and the whole risk management approach actually fits in. I actually think it's secondary prevention rather than being something that you know sits across primary, secondary and tertiary. Um, so if we can do you know good hazard identification, really prioritize our, um, based on risk, you know what other things that are most likely to cause people harm, um, and then put in controls, um, that address the, the root cause of, of the stress rather than just helping people to deal with the symptoms of stress, um, I think will go a longer way to actually preventing psychological injuries you know, at, a, at a larger work group or population level. And this is where the hierarchy of controls come in, right? And I, and I think um, you know, understanding that when organisations do things like education or giving people access to a mindfulness app, Really, these are akin to, you know, PPE or administration levels of control, which health and safety people know are the least effective controls in actually um, addressing or controlling uh, risks um, and start thinking about um, higher level controls, like how do we eliminate um, the, the source of stress at, at, its, at its core or how do we redesign work um, so that people aren't getting ill because of the work that they're doing. When we start implementing, you know, those higher order controls, I think we'll have a better um, impact on what the goal is, right? Which is to prevent, you know, people having to take so many t days off work due to stress, anxiety, and depression. Um, so uh, even though some people would debate whether the hierarchy of controls is an appropriate kind of um, uh, concept to apply to the management of psychological risks, I, I think, you know, in, in a lot of instances, it does actually fit 
uh, quite nicely and at least gives us a, I an idea of thinking about, well, how do we eliminate or redesign first before putting yeah. the responsibility on those poor employees who are already stressed to their eyeballs to just be more mindful and, you know, accept the conditions uh, of their yeah. workplace, which are far from ideal. Which if you look at hierarchy control is the very bottom element anyway. Um, but I, it's interesting. We, I mean, we, we have had these discussions about hierarchy of control, have we not? I think there's almost a, a necessity for a hybrid model, don't you? And actually, it combines elements of, of hierarchy control, but also with the primary, secondary, and tertiary. But getting back to the secondary, um, what is the training of managers and organizations in managing people's he- mental health come into that? Yeah, so that I would say um, might even sit even uh, aside it, I mean, it can be a risk control, but it's not really necessarily addressing addressing a specifically identified risk, right? It might be, you know, something that helps support the uh, management of psychological health and safety as a system, if you like, um, and maybe broader risk control rather than getting at a specific control. Um, so it's like a more organizational level intervention. So you can have organizational level work group interventions and individual level interventions. So uh, it is probably something that would fit in as primary prevention. Like it's something that, yeah. you know, depending on what the um, skill development or knowledge development is, is based at, because the line manager training could mean a lot of different things, right? Um, but it could be something that could be conceived as either primary prevention or, or secondary prevention. Um, yeah, it, I feel it, that, it that's the big that yeah. bridges both, doesn't it? Um, the reason we ask is obviously is there's a proliferative of training courses to make you a better manager. Now, do they necessarily yeah. make you a better manager that reduces stress? Or do they make you just a better manager that delivers on a, on a product or, or be whatever that it is? Um, yeah, so, um, we, I mean... It's in the title, that. isn't it? It's yeah. And well-being. So the... But um, even even communi- tra- communication training for uh, line managers, right, that would be something that would address a risk, right? If, if it, you had identified that poor leadership or poor communication uh, was one of your psych hazards, then if you gave training to leadership on that, that would be risk control. Uh, and that probably would be like an administration type risk, maybe even redesign um, at that level. Um, however, if you just had generic line manager training that kind of gave line managers a bunch of different skills, um, not necessarily targeted at addressing a specific risk, then I don't know where that would fit in. And, you know, it's maybe just good primary prevention, right? Let's make sure we have good leaders in place because we know that's a good thing. Jason, use it to my ears, primary prevention all the way through that. Yeah. So- oh, yeah. I mean, well, you don't have to do job redesign if you do the work design well, to begin with, right? If we know yeah, what yeah. makes good work, right? Let's make it meaningful. Let's give people really good opportunities for relationships and high levels of support. You're less likely to have to go and redesign that that work. What do you do though, Jason, with jobs that are inherently have stress built into them? Um, if you take, if you let's take a simple view of the hierarchy of control yeah. model. If the job is the source of the stress. The primary perspective, oh, sorry, did I say primary? The first point they interject uh, is the elimination. What if you can't eliminate the job? What's the hybrid version of that? Because you can't take the job away. Let's say if you're, uh, let's go for the traditional um, policeman or ambulance, you know, blue light services. Exactly, where you're going into a high, high, you know, high level of uh, potentially high level of of uh, of stress very quickly. So you can't take that away from that. So what would, where where do you think hierarchy sits in that? If, yeah, if you remember- can't eliminate the job, what else can you do at the at the hierarchical level? Yeah, and I think that's where you know we can be over simplistic and go well, you know, this job itself is is hazardous um i think we need to really under unpack what the role actually is i mean Mm. if we think about you know a first responder you know there's going to be times when they're going to be sitting around and doing nothing it's not going to be like yeah sympathetic nervous system being activated the whole time um we really need to think about different elements of the role and then once we understand when the stress occurs and to what frequency um, who's affected, how long are they affected for, then we can start to develop controls that might actually address it. 
Uh, and so you'd be aware, Pete, that some of the things that people do is making sure that if they're going to be um, known that they're going to be exposed to stress, then we do actually have to equip these people with some skills um, and train them up on, you know, knowing what to expect. So realistic job previews and, you know, training about the traumatic situation before they're actually put into the traumatic situation, having um, good debriefing, um, you know, in place, making sure that there is um, good job or, rotations. Or in not, in not informal debriefing as well, isn't it, Jason? Is that yeah, or it could be peer to peer, yeah. Yeah, um, the, the dark humor is, as they call it in emergency services that goes with the yeah. job. Um, yeah, but the reason- um, you know, yeah, so uh, we've had this conversation before, right? You can't just eliminate the role of a police officer, but you look at aspects of the role, you understand what aspects of the role are actually hazardous for their mental health and well being, and then you look at, well, how would we actually address that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we were, um, there's an emerging issue amongst police forces with, um, particularly in capital cities where um, routinely in the past you'd have a call out to a, ter- a potential terrorism event once in a career. Um, you know, we are, we're, we're seeing it, uh, we have seen in the past where police are talking about that there, there's multiple times they've been called out to events, potential events, and how that, and so actually the way we, 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 we train people uh, for preparation for those things has to change and reflect the fact that it's you know it's a different it's a different sort of culture and you know it's a it's a different time and actually um, you know um, these people need to be prepared. Isn't it funny? Yerkes and Dobson's Law, nineteen oh seven, which we've said previously, you know, which talks about this concept of pressure, um, and that if you have too much pressure, you you burn out. If you don't have enough pressure, you you rust out. Do you think that's a good analogy for where we are at the moment in COVID nineteen? Yeah. Well. Um... We've kind of deviated there. Um, I still uh, want to it's, talk about this. It's, inten- uh, it's an intentional deviation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the uh, the police officer one is still very interesting to me and, um, you know, what could be done in that space. And um, But, yeah, so Jörg Stobson, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? So um, we know that stress is cumulative. Um, you know, something I hear often from, you know, workplaces or line managers is, well, no, stress is a personal thing. You know, I can't help it that, you know, he's having a separation from his partner or his child has uh, a disability or, you know, they've got financial pressures. I can't do anything about that. That's stress that they're bringing into work. But there are other uh, stresses within the workplace that would be potentially within the remit of the line manager to address, like the level of support that they're providing with people, pro- providing to people, the level of role clarity and, and that sort of thing. So, um, the problem is when you have all these stresses at home and then you have stresses at work, that increases the the risk that someone is actually going to have an adverse reaction to um, the stresses in their life, right? Throw in a macro level event like a, a pandemic, that's just another stressor on people. Uh, and I know, you, you know, you're also, Pete, I've heard you talk about like, the fact that we've got a global recession on as well. We're going well here in Australia, thankfully. We've got a great economy at the moment, uh, thanks to the price of iron ore. Um, but, you know, we do have all of these these impacts and we've got to understand well it's a cumulative effect of stress that will lead to people becoming ill and having to take time off work the workplace can't control the fact that there's a pandemic the workplace can't control the fact that this poor guy's about to lose his house because of some bad investment decisions that he's made but they can actually uh, impact the level of supervisory support that person feels that they have and the level of role clarity that they have and i think that's where um you know, companies need more guidance. They don't need to control all the stress and pressures and personal issues that people have in their life. But the things that they can control, those are the things that they should they should seek to understand and control. Now, Vince Butler is here. What would Vince say? Where does the Vince, responsibility? Vince, where does the Where does the responsibility lie? So this is Vince would first say how much he loves Joel because everyone loves Joel, um, and he'd say, "Where is Joel? Why isn't she on this podcast? Why is Jason, you know, nattering on on, on this podcast?" Because um, Joel Vince had to go say, home and he's got children, childcare responsibilities. <laughs> Vince, would, yeah, that's right. So Vince would probably uh, say, "Why are we focusing on mental health when there's so many people dying every day?" Um, you know, around the world due to, um, you know, not having safe workplaces. Is that where you're going, Pete? Because I reckon that's what he'd say because he, he says it on LinkedIn commonly when we put up a post around mental health and psychological health and safety. He's like, why are you focusing on this, Jace, when people are still dying around the world? But he'd also say, actually, he, the, the, the value in keeping people healthy 
is hugely important because we know we've talked about this actually people who are experiencing mental health um at, at, you know work related stress um they will engage and do things in a different way which potentially leads to to a, a safety incident uh, to coming up we've already talked about the fact that you know we did we talked recently about the the gentleman who was on your show um who Jason uh, Anker. Yep. yeah Jason Anker, where you know he just wasn't his head wasn't in the in, in it as he says and uh, he, he ended up having you know he had his fall on on, on the job um so there you can see a very real practical world example of what happens when we don't manage people's mental health, um, it's not just the fact that they become depressed and anxious. It's the fact they may actually um, have periods of where their concentration is impaired, et cetera. So, um, so I think Vince would probably, you know, be, be both ways. He certainly would say what you've said, but I think also he, perhaps he'd acknowledge that. So, but I mean, it, it, it's a fascinating area, really, and that we, that we find ourselves in. And we could chat for like an hour, but uh, I think we agreed we were going to do half an hour. But uh, how, how far are, are we into it, Sheila? Um, we are probably about thirty-five minutes. Thirty-five. Yeah. Minutes. So this is this is the difference, right? We're doing this as a crossover podcast with the original Psych Health and Safety podcast, <laughs> yes. and uh, we're a long format, and you're a shorter format. So uh, we'll, we can we can well, split it. Jason, I, I think I think we can run this for another ten minutes and do forty-five minutes. I mean, but obviously, oh, I'm conscious. We're happy to happy to chat. I'm conscious that you to look after your own health and well-being because you. Uh, uh, it's what time is it, Jason? Uh, it's going on 5.30, but you know what? I've had oh, a Red Bull. And my, it's, it's in the system. Yeah. We might as well use it. Yeah. No, no, that's no, brilliant. So in terms of um, where do you see the future for this area in the context yeah. of the pandemic and without the pandemic? Do you, see, do you think what that, uh, that, that effectively... Um, the, the pandemic and the recession have brought us to a position where we can actually push this forward and can make a real difference, which we were doing before, by the way, <laughs> but we can make a real difference at this time. Where does the future lie? Yeah, um, I've said it before. Uh, I believe the pandemic has really shone a light on, on mental health. I mean, I you know, saw the trend years ago. Uh, with that increasing frequency and cost of psychological injuries um, from work-related uh, factors. Uh, and that's obviously why we started to pursue, you know, what could we do at scale with a technology platform to address that. Um, but what COVID has done, I think, has really brought forward our agenda a good three to five years with that intense focus now that has been put on the effect of, of mental health. Uh, be really interesting, obviously, with your next reporting period. Does it come out in October, the new Labour Force uh, survey? Yeah, it does, yeah. It, it'll either go yeah. one or two ways. It'll be uh, under-reporting, so, but higher presenteeism, or our numbers will be up. So um, it, it, the interesting thing is how people view it. Well, you see, people weren't really impacted by their mental health. Mm. If the numbers are low, the, the, the issue is that we know presenteeism is, uh, is huge, at the moment, uh, we know this because there are surrogate surveys that people use, which identify presenteeism as 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 being in there. Um, uh, every day, I pick up the paper here in the UK. I don't know, it's the same in Australia. Story about mental health, story about well-being, story about people's mental health being impacted, um, and yet uh, the the data that we collect may not necessarily reflect that. And I think we have to contextualise it that the data is one sort one 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 perspective one way of identifying where we see the see that it is but also we have to look at look at what else is happening in around uh, in in this in society in general so um yeah so I, I really think you know there are some drivers that are you know coming online this year uh, in australia on the back of a review of our whs act you know we are expected to have amendments in there that will you know start using the terminology around psychological health and not just relying on a general definition of health that's supposed to incorporate both psychological and physical um mm. so that will make a difference we have regulators or you know because we have state regulators versus you know a uk regulator um so they're starting to draft codes of practices about how companies can you know um, comply with the existing legislation which is already supposed to you know incorporate both psychological and physical health 
Uh, but obviously with the increased focus around psychological health in the upcoming uh, amendments, you know, how can they meet their obligations under the Act? Uh, and then you, you have the global standards like ISO as well. So I think there's a lot mm. of um, really good drivers, uh, a lot of carrots, uh, still not enough stick, Pete, and I'm not going to put you on the spot about why we're not getting enough stick on, on this if so many people are becoming uh, ill. You know you know me, mate. I'll, I'll always, my preference is for the stick. Um, but, um, <laughs> you know, we, we've used the carrot uh, I, I, I say it very openly, and um, we will be we will use stick in the right situation. With in terms of, if you know, it meets the criteria which we've publicly put on, on our website for investigation purposes. Um, but I think you're, I think you're on something with the insurers, though. I think that's where the pressure really has to come. If they're the ones that are holding, you know, the um, the, the 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 bill for you know these psychological injuries, then whether that's through life insurance, you know, um, whether it's through TPD, whether it's through workers' compensation insurance, um, you know, if people aren't able to work because of a work-related illness that they've developed because work has been poorly managed, uh, and the insurers are paying for it, well, they should be in, like you know pressuring their clients to take more of a risk management systemic approach and stop thinking that a mindfulness app or a fruit bowl or yoga is going to do the trick. Which is a very nice plug into the last question, which is, um, what do you see the role for 45,003? Does it have a role or will it just be a, a standard that sits on a, on a bookcase that you can blow it when you're asked by your inspector whether or not you've read it? Although, can I point out, as, as um, I'm hoping you will do, it isn't, it's a voluntary standard, but it's, um, mm -hmm. it, it would be very useful. <laughs> to show that you're doing stuff on managing people's mental health and it would so yeah what do you see for the for 45,003 do you see it as um a useful building block do you see it as just an, an extra burden what yeah I'm hoping well, you I... don't go for the second thing <laughs> well if it's done correctly it shouldn't be an extra burden i mean obviously there are activities that a company would need to do that most aren't doing currently around hazard identification and controlling those risks um, but if they incorporated it under their occupational health and safety management system say forty five thousand and one, for instance um, then it's designed to be a logical extension of that or you know um, not be uh, another thing that you're doing it should be incorporated in how you manage all health and safety risks, right? But there's just some extra guidance around, you know, what are the specific hazards that we're concerned about and, you know, how would you go about identifying those hazards because they're not directly observable, like, you know, say uh, a physical hazard in the workplace. So I'm hoping, um, you know, that gives companies a lot more guidance. I believe um, last time Sheila and I had a look, there was about 38,000 certificates um, that had been issued for 45,001. Um, so I think there's a lot of companies who really value, you know, being certified to that standard for their OCH health and safety management system. And I'm hoping a large majority of those organizations at some stage will go, well, look, let's also incorporate 45,003 uh, into these activities. So given the yeah. number of, of companies who have adopted 45,001, hopefully there'd be a large number that also adopt it and start doing, you know, more systemic risk management kind of activities versus, you know, leaving HR to do all the, the wellness kind of stuff that we know doesn't, it hasn't had an impact, has it, Pete? I mean, the numbers keep going up. So clearly what we're, we're doing, all the popular approaches aren't working. We need to do something different. Uh, 2.5 million in a year um, from the previous day. So yeah, the numbers are going up. Um, you know, we are uh, uh, certainly in the, we were in the eye of the storm, then the storm came and it came twice. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, coming out of the eye of the storm is going to be, it's going to be different. Um, we know 45,003, uh, there's, there's some conversations about it being uh, that you can get 45,003 without 45,001, uh, you could, you know, as, 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 a, as a document. Um, clearly, there are some benefits from doing 45,001 with 45,003. Um, but I think, uh, you know, for, for me, yeah, 45,003, almost offers a unique opportunity to back up on existing stuff that's, that's already happening. So in Australia, the, the standards work, um, the, each of the um, individual states and their work around, you know, um, risk assessments and that it, it can sit there for us. It sits on uh, on with our, uh, our approach to, from a regular perspective, which is, you know, looking at, looking at the risks and managing it and, you know, et cetera. So the management standards, um, 
and you'll probably find the management standards in the uh, in, in in there as an example. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's ironic, isn't it? Three years of work, one year into a pandemic, and this standard kind of just just arrives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's great that you guys thought of that in the midst of the pandemic and were able to get your act together to, you know. Well, most of this work was done pre-pandemic. Um, <laughs> I, know, I know, I'm being facetious again. Sorry, yeah. mate. Although we, we have had, for the purposes of just understanding, we have had several weeks of Zoom calls, which means uh, switch popping the timeframes around. So that could mean uh, us being on Zoom calls at five o'clock in the morning so that you guys could go home early, at a normal time. Or, yeah, so it, 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 certainly from the health and well-being, I perspective i did you know point it out the thing i said and the thing i'll say here is make it real make sure that people understand what the terminology remember who the people are that we're trying to talk to and hopefully i think that's reflected in 45003 which takes me back to my original question is this area is complicated by terminology that mm. people don't necessarily understand and our job through these podcasts is to is to break that down, isn't it? It's to make it yeah. seem, oh, so actually this is something that you can do to manage people. This is something to do that will help people and it'll improve their health. And by doing that, you improve the your own productivity in your company. Clear, clear relationship between um, healthy individuals and healthy companies, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the big message is that, you know, the reason that we need standards like 45,003 is that the popular approaches to workplace mental health just have not proven effective. And if we are actually going to make a dent, then we need to take more of a safety management system approach, I really feel. And then like the evidence from the Canadian standard, which ISO is also, you know, built on, you know, mm. there is evidence to show if you take that systemic approach, it is far more effective. Um, at reducing outcomes like burnout or increasing engagement or, you know, um, all those sort of things versus let's just give people a massage at work and then, you know, that'll be it. We're done, you know, and that's an easy thing, right? It's a box tick tick ticking exercise. But if the executives um, and health and safety people and HR people who are listening to this podcast get anything out of it, it's to understand the reason that these standards are coming out is that the popular approaches don't work. So let's have a look at what we can do through applying things like ISO, um, and, uh, you know, if the end goal is to make uh, workplaces better places to be for everyone and that people don't just get, not get ill by going to work, but they actually come out of work in a better place mentally, which they should, if work is designed well, then let's start taking a better approach to how we do it. Yeah. Like which one of us signed a contract said, yeah, I'll be made ill at work. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's not quite there, is, is it? Well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Sheila sum up. Okay, well, it's been... <laughs> we've, we've, it's just like we've been, just been in the pub together. Really. Yeah. <laughs> just, 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 for, the record, the for, the, for the record, this is what we did do. <laughs> you had it's had a very similar alcohol. conversation. Yeah. For the record, Peter had a non-alcoholic drink at the pub because it was in work hours. So. <laughs> yes, it was, yeah. But no, I Jason think, didn't. No, as, as always, no. you guys have, you know, wealth of information um, around the standard. Um, I think one question I'd just like to ask both of you, um, you know, one thing I've heard or I hear a lot is that um, people don't take these strategic approaches because it's hard to do and they don't know where to start. I mean, we've said today there's code of practice out there, there's legislation out there. I know we've had the conversation, Jason, before that, you know, if leadership is not on board with it, it's not, you know, the chances of success are going to be quite, quite poor. Um, and how do we kind of get leaders, you know, what would be your message to leaders in terms of getting them to see the strategic value of doing this? Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting, right? Like you say, I mean, when was the stress management standard come out? Was that 94 or 2004? 2004. Yeah, 2004. It's been out for almost Mate, 20 I've, years. I, that, 2004. Yeah, it's yeah, officially so, a teenager, 17 years old. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. On the it's been out for a while. And, uh, you know, we, um, and then, you know, the Canadian national standard, right, for psych health and safety at work. It's been around since 2013. That's an excellent, excellent document. And even also, Australia, also based on the management standards. Yeah, yeah, they're all, they all, you know, that, that, was the, that was the source of truth, right? That was the originator for all of these things, right? No, to be honest, the Canadians uh, did everything we wanted to do but couldn't do. So, yeah, I was, uh, I mean, this, that the Canadian standard is, for me, got elements of it. I would have loved to have obviously had... Um, 
Yeah, and look, um, you know, uh, I, I, they've, I've, I've spoken to a number of the um, the Canadians behind that standard on our podcast, and you know, they've actually said that they reckon ISO would actually be more achievable than the Canadian standard. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, but I think the the place where leaders need to start is first of all understand um, the gaps. Um, look at what are they doing as uh, a, an organisation already for workplace mental health, and, and look at where the gaps are. You know, that's why we created a tool for this. Um, we call it the Workplace Mental Health Audit Tool, so mentalhealthaudit.com. Um, and it basically shows you what are the things you should be doing from a health and safety perspective or a compliance kind of angle if you're in places like the UK or Australia with the general duties. Um, and then what are the desirable things like you know EAP or mental health first aid or all those sorts of things. Um, so I, I think they really need to understand where the gaps are. And I think a lot of them would be shocked that they're actually not meeting their legal obligations first and they're doing all these other nice-to-haves that actually haven't proven to move the needle um, in relation to keeping people well and, and optimising well-being. Uh, so that's generally where I'd, I'd start. And then it's about getting your health and safety team, giving them resources to work in this space. Um, often it's HR that actually you know, carry the, the portfolio for, for workplace mental health. Um, but the, you know, they typically will do things like employee engagement surveys or EAP or, you know, do training around competencies or mental health first aid. Um, but they're not the ones with the risk management capabilities or experience. So really giving your health and safety team um, training on things like the ISO standard or, you know, um, understanding psych hazards, you know, bringing up their competence to then bring up the rest of the company's competence as well. Mm-hmm. So they're probably yeah. good to, two places to start, I'd say. Yeah, I just agree with what Jason said. I mean, how would you talk yeah. about that then, Pete? Let's do a slightly question, different question to you. So, in terms of it strategically, well, what I would say in, the into culture. the previous question, yeah. though, which yeah. maybe Jason was going to, I'm sure Jason was going to come around to, it was the impact of leadership and authentic yeah. leadership. Um, you know, the the organisations that do this well have got leaders that have said, back it up and say this is important to it, it's a key, it's a key performance indicator for this company. Um, I'd like to see KPIs. I want KPIs on mental health and on the management of mental health as, as part of, the, as, as part of a, a standard reporting for, for organisations. So I think that link to make them do it uh, from a board level is really important, but you need, you need people that are engaged in that area. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I would, I would, um, if you're going to measure the performance, not just look at outcomes like burnout or uh, illness or exactly. EAP, usage, but also look at how many risk assessments have we done? What are, do, do all the work groups that we have um, understand what their key hazards are and do they have a plan in place to address them? Right. So measuring those sorts of things, which could actually be, you know, assurance really against the standard, um, yeah. versus purely looking at outcomes because then, you know, those things are lag indicators. Whereas, you know, um, do we, are we actually doing good risk management at a work group level, not just at an organization level, mm-hmm. uh, would be far more effective from a measurement perspective, I'd say. Oh, and on the whole leadership thing as well, Pete, there's a lot of um, platitudes out there, right? You know, leaders will say mental health is important. Um, uh, and then they'll say work harder. <laughs> um, so what yeah, we really gonna, need... it, it has to be a live. It has to be a live value in a lived situation. Yeah. You know. But I think there needs to be evidence that leadership is supporting this. So until they actually have this ingrained in policy, and not just say you know we think mental health is important, but actually committing to we're going to do risk um, assessment yeah. and risk management. We're going to provide resources for um, you know health and safety people and all employees to understand and, and we're going to address what we find. So well. Yes. Yeah. So a commitment in policy, right? Because then it doesn't just become a one-off activity. It's actually something that has legs and is going to, you know, continue. So that's, that's really important to make sure it's ingrained in policy and um, there's resources provided, not just, oh, you've got to do this now on top of everything else. And we're not going to provide you with training or money or time to do it. You know, the leadership also need to allocate the, the time and budget. Otherwise it's, again, it's just platitudes. It's not really going to have any impact. Yeah. You just can't pay lip service to this, can they? No. I butted in on your question. Sorry. <laughs> As usual, Jason, gone for an hour. Yeah, yeah. This will just be the first long one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will say half an hour, probably end up half an hour. It's, it's, a, it's such an amazing, you know, it's such a, an area that, um, that we need to talk about. You know, the fact that we're yeah. doing podcasts on this um, after uh, spending 20 years promoting and pushing the, the the mental health and 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 stress at work um 
agenda i think is a great thing and hopefully um what these podcasts will do is you know particularly in the the uk one is is to help give people a better understanding of what the issues are and we will we've got a range of great speakers that we're looking to to bring in Mm -hmm. uh sheila does that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she just, so I'm like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> but uh, but it's been nice to nice to chat with you, Jason. Always um, good to chat with you. I put a shirt on, just pointing out uh, for the um, Jason. Obviously, in Australia, it's warm, so they can wear short sleeve shirts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, it's been great having you. What about you, Sheila? Any extra, any more questions? No, no more from me. Just, you know, thanks to both of you guys for kind of bringing your wealth of knowledge and expertise um, and sharing that with the listeners.